The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke in the fourth chapter, a lectionary gospel reading for this morning. And Jesus came to Nazareth, the place he had been brought up. And he went to the synagogue, as his custom was, on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are op oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. Will you please be seated? Let us pray together. Breathe on us, breath of God and fill us with life anew. Amen. How did you learn to swim? Knowing that I was in, raised in the Old South, you probably think my father took me off to the end of the pier and threw me into the water. And I've heard of some doing that. But no, like many my age group, we learned to swim at the YMCA. My water life began in the shallow end of the pool. And it was a place where chaos reigned. Water fights, dunkings, screeching and hollering and children diving jumping and cannonballing upon innocent victims. And I would look down to the end of the pool at the deep end and it was so quiet and calm. I longed to be there, but I could not swim. So I decided that if I was going to survive the pool experience of life. I must learn to swim because the deep water is much safer than the shallow. In the YMCA where I learned to swim, there were at least three classes of swimming lessons. First, you became a minnow. And then if you were survived a minnow class without drowning, you became a fish. And then after fish was the elite sharks and on to the swim team. I was so elated the day that I made fish and then later shark because I could move far from the maddening crowd. Dr. William Self from Georgia has written a piece called Swimming in the Deep End. And what he does, he makes an analogy between swimming in the deep end and the shallow end. He 
This is some quotes by the Barna Institute, which is the American institute that studies American Christianity and the trend in the American church. And as most of you know, that the statistics do not fare well for the mainline churches in America. We are being devastated by the shifting cultural demands. And yet, many independent churches have shown substantial numerical growth. But the Barna Institute reveals other facts as well. While the independent type churches numerically are rising, statistics don't find that discipleship and commitment to Jesus Christ is that much greater. One pastor is quoted as saying, our people in my congregation are committed in every way but three. And those three are lifestyle, mindset, and values. Beyond that, they're very committed to the gospel. A California pastor says, they come for the show but then refused to grow. Using Dr. Self's analogy, there seems to be a lot of excitement in the shallow end of the pool. And it makes one wonder if the so-called successful churches have not in fact gone into show business. Years ago, uh, the rodeo's coming. Years ago, I went to the uh, San Antonio rodeo and went down the midway of the carnival. And for some reason, I stopped when I heard the barker yelling out, Come see Stella, the snake woman. She's alive. She's inside. One dollar. See that which your eyes cannot believe, Stella, the snake woman, a lie. And in order to entice us to spend the dollar or so, they brought out a man on a small platform named Popeye. And this man could actually make his eyeballs come out about an inch on either side, or he could do it in uh, like kind of rhythm. And so the queue lined up to pay their dollar to see the alligator man and Stella, the snake woman, alive. What fools, I said, after I exited the exhibit, <laughs> having seen Stella alive. I'm not going to tell you the trick. It's something you have to experience for yourself. We, we live in a day in America where the consumer rules in the Christian churches. Dr. Self pins, American church attendance is very style conscious. Demanding, in his opinion, music that sounds like a nightclub. Pulpit attire similar to the country club. And sermons that will not offend anyone and they're more like motivational speeches than they are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. End quote. And some of the advertisements that I have seen remind me of the Barkers on the Midway at any carnival. Come see our preacher, they said. He doesn't wear a tie. As a matter of fact, he wears tennis shoes. Come to our church. 
We're fundamentalists. No, we're moderates. We're liberals. We have a political agenda. Come here. Come to this church because we have video going while the pastor preaches. Just in case you get bored with the sermon, you can watch the video. We'd have a lot of watchers. Have any of you ever played, gone down the midway of the carnival and played any of those carnival games? Raise your hand now. Have you ever won? Charles won. A very few people win the big stuffed animal by throwing the darts at the balloons or by taking the softball and knocking over all those metal bottles there. As a matter of fact, I played a game that you were guaranteed to win. It had little plastic ducks floating along, and all you had to do was pick up a duck and look at the number, and they gave you the prize. It ended up costing about two cents. You paid a buck fifty for it. If we design Christianity like a carnival, no one wins a prize, really, because no lives are ever changed. Phil read to you from the church, uh, Paul's letter to the book, uh, to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. We've got a problem in Corinth. It's a church marketing problem. Yes, even in the first century, there was church marketing marketing come to our church and follow us because we follow peter the prince of apostles the rock of the church no don't go there come to our church because we follow the greatest theologian the apostle paul no don't go there come to our church we have a silver-tongued orator named apollos and then finally another one says, no, come to our church because we're the only ones that have the real Jesus. Do you hear any of the shallow end of the pool in this problem? Paul writes, No other foundation for the church except Jesus Christ. No other foundation can one build a church except Christ Jesus. And I wonder... In all the churches that seem to be scrambling to find their own niche in the church's market, is it really a cover for empty hearts, for shallow commitments, and a secular mindset? Unless the church's foundation is in Christ Jesus, the living Christ. There will be no substance, neither will there be power. I'm talking about not the Jesus that we make up in our mind, but the living Christ, the one to whom scriptures point. That Christ, if that Christ is the foundation, the gates of death shall not prevail. Does that Christ walk in our halls of this church? Does that Christ, the Spirit of Christ, sit next to you in the pew? Does that Christ listen in on our classes? 
Is that Christ seeing harmony with you as you sing the hymns? Does that Christ try to get hard-headed preachers to preach the gospel? If he is not the foundation, then no gimmick on this planet will ever work. I met for three hours with our session yesterday and I talked about a new vision for this church. And we talked about a number of wonderful things and we are in a process of setting course for a new vision. But the beginning point, the very beginning point is not a commitment to this church. Rather, it is a passionate commitment to Christ Jesus. It's not a passionate commitment to our future or a political ideology or to a style-oriented kind of church, our own niche. We don't begin our focus with what the consumer demands or one thread of theological wisdom. We begin, we begin a new vision on Christ. Rediscover Christ. Now, you're thinking, I've known Christ my whole life. And I'm standing up here as a minister of the gospel, having served this church coming up 32 years, and I will tell you, as a matter of fact, all of us must rediscover Christ and seek a new vision periodically. Otherwise, it's just old hat. We're just repeating the same old mantra. And the power goes away. The wise things that Christ would lead us to dissipate like the fog in the morning. That does not mean we do not make some accommodations to the changing world out there and how we try to share our vision of Christ with them. It does not mean we don't embrace the validity of different experiences with Christ and ours. But first, we must rediscover the majesty, the beauty, and the power of a strong commitment to Christ and Christ alone. And only then, are we ever liberated from the tyranny of fad addiction, addiction to fads? When you leave here this morning, like any other morning, the central question must be, did I meet Jesus today? You're probably sitting there thinking, going, gosh, this is a lot different than other sermons you've preached, some theological abstraction. Simple question. Did I meet Jesus today? Or did I allow Jesus to live in me today when I went to church? Did I see somebody, a visitor maybe, walk into the congregation looking a little afraid. A strange world this is in here. Did I allow Jesus to live in me to go up and embrace them into the fellowship of Christ? Good Sabbath. I know you. Except for a few of you, most of you are introverts. 
And I know how difficult it is for us to break out of our shell and go out of our comfort zone and welcome. Because I'm an introvert too. I'm so introverted, they don't have a scale for my introversion. But I believe that even though our basic personality types may be one way, the Spirit of Christ can motivate us to move beyond our comfort zone and courage. Was I Christ for someone today? Was I the gospel? Was I the good news to some future saint or some lost saint? Did I help a spiritually blind person to see or liberate, help liberate someone who was captive by things they cannot speak of? Did I meet Jesus? Did somebody meet Jesus through me? The question is never, was my opinion and style supported today? Doonesbury cartoon has been around a long, long time, and it's often so serious that it appears in the editorial section and not in the funny papers. Mike is usually the central character of the Dudensbury cartoon. And Mike, in this particular cartoon, is looking for a church. And he interviews the pastor of the little church at Walden. Mike asks the pastor, how did you get your church started? And the pastor responded, well, we surveyed the community and we found out that they wanted aerobics. So we got an aerobics class going. And then we found out they wanted basket weaving. And then we got basket weaving classes going and it blossomed. And then they wanted to jog. So we all started jogging and before we knew it, we'd started us a good church. As a matter of fact, it's been so successful, we're now a whole denomination. And Mike scratches his head as he often does, for he knew nothing about the gospel. And said, so that's how religion spreads. No. It spreads because the living Christ changes lives. Anything else we do will die. Oh, it may have its day in the sun, but sooner or later it goes belly up. And for our Irish visitors, belly up means croak. I didn't know that it was an indigenous term to Texas. But when the congregation and members rediscover Christ, people will come for the show and stay to grow. And when we are renewing within us the Spirit of Christ daily, the only sounds that we will hear is the sound of those who are swimming from the shallow end to the deep end, far from the maddening crowd. For it is in the deep end that we will feel much safer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.